Hi, welcome to our Sabbath School Study Hour here at the Granite Bay Hilltop Church in the greater Sacramento area in California. Thank you so much for spending this time with us, studying the Bible with us. We're having a great study of this quarter's lesson. We have been studying from this lesson right here, which is Psalms. And today is our last lesson, lesson number 13, which has the title, Wait on the Lord. But before we get into the lesson, I'd like to invite you to take advantage of this free offer right here. It's called The Last Night on Earth. And if you'd like to uh, acquire this free offer, you could call the number 866-788-3966 and you could ask for the offer number 101. If you're in continental North America, you can text SH081 to the number 40544 and you'll get a digital download. Or if you're outside of North America, you could go to study.aftv.org slash SH081 and you could also get a digital download. And so as you study this final lesson of our quarter, this small study guide will be a companion to it and provide additional information, additional insight and details into your own personal study. Before we start, I would like to invite you to say a word of prayer with me. So please, wherever you are, bow your head. Dear Lord God, thank you so much for the privilege of Scripture. Thank you so much for the insight and the revelation of who you are through these beautiful words, these deep and insightful words, Father. We've studied from the book of Psalms this entire quarter, and Lord, it has been so deep just to see the raw human emotion, the highs and the lows, Lord, as we go through life and as we witness these psalmists going through life. Please allow us to... Um, bring to our life, to apply to our life the different lessons that are learned here, Lord. Allow us to learn either by adherence, the good positive lessons, and the things that we should keep away from, Lord. Allow us to learn by contrast as well. Please bless those that are watching from home. Please bless their home, inhabit their home, and I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, the study of this quarter's lesson has been extremely deep. The book of Psalms is one of the most beautiful books in the Bible. It's incredibly deep. It's exceptionally raw in its emotion as we see the highs and the lows of these psalmists, the things that they go through, the joy, the celebration, and also the despair sometimes, the fear, the anguish of the deserts of life, the silence coming from God. And so I hope that you've been blessed by studying this lesson. I know that I have. Um, today's is the last lesson of our quarter, again with the title, Wait on the Lord. Learning how to wait on God throughout the most difficult moments of life is truly one of the most important and one of the deepest virtues of the Christian life. But it's one of the hardest learned lessons as well. It comes sometimes through trial and error, through the deserts. And I hope that as we go through the week's lessons, as we study what each day is bringing to us, we can learn um, not only the ideas, not only the abstract, the abstract uh, depth of this, but that we can also apply it in our everyday life. There's so much here that we need to learn how to apply, how to live, not only find beautiful. You know, one of the hardest parts of studying the Bible is translating the, 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 the knowledge, translating the wisdom, the discernment that we see in the pages of scripture, translating that into our everyday life. It's easy to read, it's easy to find beautiful, it's easy to, you know, even uh, find remarkable the things that are happening, but when it comes to applying it to our life, we sometimes have a hard time because, well, <laughs> that translation from abstract knowledge, abstract thought to the everyday life, it's not always easy. Anyway, I hope that that's something that we can truly uh, pursue in our study of, of this last week of the quarter. Our memory verse comes from Psalm chapter 27, verse 14, and I'd love to read it for you before we actually begin. Psalm 27, verse 14, that says this, Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. You know, one of the most recurrent themes in the Bible, in fact, one of the most recurrent orders that God gives his children is to be strong, to not fear, to be of good courage. And so at the beginning of our lesson, that's what we're finding here. You know, our journey through the Psalms, it culminates with this poignant message, wait on the Lord. What does that mean? What does it mean to wait on the Lord? Again, it's a reminder of the multifaceted nature of our spiritual walk with God. There are so many things that are involved in the way that we act and react with the Lord that we have to take into account. And this week's final study finds itself rooted in our memory verse and what we just read. Again, to wait on the Lord. 
And that encapsulates this deep spiritual truth. And this is what we're going to spend a considerable portion of our time today talking about, which is waiting on the Lord. It's an active, vibrant expression of faith, not a passive resignation. Some people see waiting on the Lord as just sitting back. Friends, if we take what this lesson brings to us seriously, it's much more of an active uh, activity, an active thing than reactive. Throughout the Psalms, we've encountered themes of, for example, awe in the presence of our incredible God. Awe in the joys of divine deliverance, forgiveness, and the depths of human sorrow and grief. Lament. Each psalm, in its own unique way, with its own unique message, has guided us through the complexities of human life, of human emotion, and divine interaction, leading us to this culminating point here in our 13th lesson that points to trust and anticipation in God. Waiting on the Lord, friends, it's not merely a call for patience, but a directive to engage in a faith-filled life that anticipates God's action. The lesson puts it this way. It says, waiting on the Lord is not an idle and desperate biding of one's time. Instead, waiting on the Lord is an act full of trust and faith, a trust and faith revealed in action. Waiting on the Lord transforms our gloomy evenings with the expectancy of the bright morning. It strengthens our hearts with renewed hope and with peace. Friends, it's about holding on to hope during the darkest nights, confident in the dawn of God's intervention and in the dawn of his grace. The Psalms teach us that this waiting period is fertile ground for spiritual growth and a renewed strength in God. This concept of waiting, it intertwines with the assurance of God's faithfulness. There would be no way to to wait on the Lord if we weren't sure of his divine interactions in our life. The Psalms have repeatedly shown that God's presence is constant. It's constant, even when it doesn't seem so, even when it's not obvious. You'll remember that with the prophet Elijah, we find that the Lord is not found in the mighty whirlwind and the big fire flames and the roar of the night thunder. God's voice is found in that still small voice, that soothing wind. Our waiting here is underpinned by the promise of his unending faithfulness and the fulfillment of his promises in our life. And that's something that we need to learn how to claim. It provides a foundation of peace, of certainty in an uncertain world. That's the world that we live in. We don't know what comes next. We don't know what will happen in 10 minutes. Much less tomorrow, next week or next month. We make plans. We say, oh, I'm going here next year. I'm going there in two years. I'm going to visit my parents here and then... Friends, we have no idea. The truth is that life is so uncertain, so fragile. But in the Lord, it's a concrete reality that life then becomes unshakable because he is unshakable. And so these Psalms reveal precisely that. Waiting in the Lord reveals that reality of life. That's why as we reflect on the message of Psalm 27 verse 14, again, our memory verse telling us, teaching us to wait on the Lord and the broader themes of the Psalms, we're encouraged to actively wait on the Lord in our daily lives. And this means engaging in acts of faith, like working diligently in the Lord's mission fields and maintaining a posture of expectant hope, of live hope, hope that invades our everyday life in our interactions with people at home, at work, at church. People notice this. People see this. The expectancy of Jesus' second coming, Jesus' second Uh, his return. That's something that people will have to notice in your life. And so the question that you have to ask yourself sometimes is, can people see that there's something different about my life? That I live with purpose? That I live knowing that a day very soon, all of this will end? That history will draw to its close? That translates into everyday life. In doing so, friends, we align ourselves with God's timing and his purposes. Not our timing, not our purposes. And we're confident then that our waiting, it's not in vain. But it's leading us toward the ultimate fulfillment of our longing for God. And that's where we come into Sunday's lesson. The call of waiting. This invitation that God gives us. On Sunday's lesson, where we find this title here, The Call of Waiting, the essence of waiting on the Lord, as captured in Psalms 27, verse 14. Again, another chapter where you can find this theme. Chapter 37, verse 4. 
verse 7, verse 9, verse 34. There are so many key scriptures that are included here that I can't read all of them, but I'd like you to go over the lesson and notice where the lesson mentions this coming from scripture. It's not just about the stress of passive waiting that we all expect in life, that we all experience in life. It's about transforming that waiting into a spiritual act of perseverance. How can I transform my waiting into something active, a real experience with God? Now, this kind of waiting, it involves a deep trust in God's timing and in his faithfulness. And for you to be able to have faith in God's future events is by knowing his past events. Not only in the broader concept of scripture, of the Bible, of history, of prophecy, but in your own life. It means every day going back in the history of your own experience with him and noticing perhaps even the small nuanced moments where you were at certain crossroads and the Lord opened doors or closed certain doors. That's vital for the Christian experience. That kind of waiting, again, it involves a deep trust in the Lord. The Psalms teach us that waiting on the Lord, it's an active, earnest longing for God. That's what we find in David. That's what we find here in these Psalms, that they were actively waiting on the Lord. They weren't just hanging around, hanging about, just thinking and, oh, where is God? No, they were doing things. They were active and they were waiting on the Lord. It's an earnest longing for him. And this desire, it's likened in these Psalms to, for example, the intense thirst in a parched land. We find that in Psalm 63, verse 1, that says, O God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. Have you ever felt true thirst before? I have. It is a despairing experience. The only thing you can think about is water. I remember hiking. We were hiking. My wife and I were hiking up a mountain here in the uh, Sierra Ranges, uh, close to uh, Lake Tahoe. It's called Mount Talek. And, uh, you know, uh, other than the several thousand feet of elevation that you gain, you have to, you know, know how much water you're going to need to take. And our water was done halfway down. And I'll tell you that for two or three hours on the way back without water, I cried, I laughed, I think I got delirious. (laughs) It was horrible. And so here the psalmist is describing this experience, thirsting for God in a dry and parched land. Do you thirst for God that way? Oh, that we could. Oh, that we should. It's about prioritizing our relationship with the Lord above all other needs and desires because I promise you that when you're that thirsty, nothing else is a priority. And so this is what the text is talking about, trusting that his plans for us are ultimately good. We find the culmination of this in Romans chapter 8, verse 18 through 25, which expands this concept of waiting to a cosmic scale, where it says this, For I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits. Look at that. It eagerly waits. Creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, Not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. So here we find this concept of waiting in God, in hope. The whole of creation, not just humanity, not just you and me, the whole of creation is waiting with eager longing for the final revelation of God's children. And this universal anticipation of renewal, of restoration, is part of God's grand design for all of creation and for his children. And it's something that as believers, we are intimately connected with. Because if not for hope, then who are we? If hope does not identify God's people in these end times, well then what does? 
While we anticipate this ultimate salvation and the new creation, God's presence through the Holy Spirit, it assures us that we are not alone here in this moment. This period of opportunity for active spiritual growth and witnessing. That's what the waiting is. It's an opportunity for growth. And not only that, but for witnessing. Because when you are waiting on the unknown, when you are taking that first step into the unknown, waiting that the Lord knows best, that he does know what's best for his children, don't you think other people will notice that? Don't you think that your family will notice that? When I look back, for example, at Abraham, that did precisely that. Part of his power, part of what the Lord did through him was that witness of stepping out into the unknown. And so our role is to share the message of salvation, contributing to the unfolding of God's plan, even while waiting. Friends, our identity as Seventh-day Adventist Christians, it encompasses this idea of waiting with hope. We wait for Jesus' second coming and we're assured by his promise due to events such as his resurrection, his ministry for us today. And this waiting, it shapes our faith. It shapes our journey. It shapes our day-to-day life because it teaches us to trust in God's promises even when the fulfillment of our prayers seems sometimes distant. You know, you could ask a church if God always answers prayer. And some people will raise their hands. Other people, they'll be, well, there was that time that I prayed for this and nothing happened, or I prayed for that and nothing happened. And so the question, perhaps not really well understood, remains, does the Lord hear all prayers? And the answer is that yes, but he doesn't always answer it the way in which we want or expect him to answer it in. And so wading through the no's, wading through the maybe, or better, through the not yet, That's something that requires faith. The lesson puts it like this here on Sunday. It says, meanwhile, we are called to bear witness. Meanwhile, meanwhile what? Meanwhile, our waiting to plan to the plan of salvation, which will culminate in a new creation. That new creation is ultimately what we are waiting for. The final fulfillment of our hopes as Adventist Christians, whose very name, Adventist contains the idea of the hope that we await. We wait, but we know that it's not in vain. Christ's death and resurrection at the first coming is our surety of his second coming. So based on what he's done in the past for us, we're certain of what he will continue doing. Could you imagine someone going through what Christ went through to only then give up? Never. And that segues into Monday's lesson, which has the title, Peace of a Wing Child. So since we've been waiting, that's what we learned here on Sunday's lesson with its title, which is the call of waiting. It's the biblical call of awaiting in the Lord. We can then have this peace of a wing child. And it revolves around Psalm 131. And it offers deep insights into our relationship with God. How does a weaning child relate to its mother? That's basically what's going on here. This psalm, it's set against the backdrop of a world full of chaos. A world that is full of darkness, full of temptations, hardships. And this teaches us the value of humility and dependence on God. Because look, when I look around the world, when I look at the things that are happening, the wars, the rumors of wars, the uncertainty, the natural disasters, the sociological, anthropological disasters all around us, the religious problems and disasters that we have. From a human standpoint, it's easy to fall into despair. Of course it is. So it all depends on where we're looking. Are my eyes on the Lord or are my eyes anywhere else? On myself or in the world around me? And so that's the message here, that certainty, that assurance of a child with his mother. That's what this psalm is talking about. The psalmist's realization that is that pride is deceptive and self-centered. It's contrasted with the righteousness of lifting one's eyes up to God, to what he represents. And so the psalmist's confession of not seeking great matters or things too high, it reflects an understanding of God's incomprehensible. And this is the key word, incomprehensible. Friends, there are things about God that we can and will understand upon studying scripture. But there are other things 
<laughs> we're dealing with the ultimate force of the universe, the force that created gravity, thermodynamics, aerodynamics, quantum mechanics. We're talking about that God. There are things that we simply will not understand. And that's what the psalmist is referring to when he says here in Psalm 131, Lord, my heart is not haughty, nor my eyes lofty, neither do I concern myself with great matters, nor with things too profound for me. And so this humility before God's mysteries in creation is a call to acknowledge our limitations and our trust in God's understanding and guidance. And so there's something to be navigated here because Sometimes when it comes to this, we can then be tempted to just sit back and do nothing. Ah, I'm not going to understand it anyway. Could you, could you imagine if great inventors of history just sit, sat back and, well, I'm not going to understand anything. So there's a line to be uh, balanced here. But there are some things that they will be beyond us. What we struggle with here is the fact that, as humans, we want to be in control. Surrendering control, it's not something that comes in naturally to us. We want to know who, what, when, where, why, how. We want to be in charge. But the metaphor of a weaned child in Psalm 131 verse 2, it symbolizes a serene trust in God, which is akin to the comfort that a child finds in its mother's arms. And this is what we find here in Psalm 131 verse 2. Surely I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with his mother. Like a weaned child is my soul within me. This image signifies, it reveals a mature and yet childlike faith. Isn't that contradictory? A mature yet childlike? Not when it comes to scripture. Because in the Bible, the mature way to relate to God is with a childlike faith. That's what we're called to, to live, to experience in our life with Christ. Mature but childlike faith that is content and assured in God's presence, despite life's complexities and challenges. And so throughout our journey of faith, we're weaned from superficial ambitions and pride and we're introduced to the solid nourishing of doing God's will. That's how it works with the Christian life. And so this mature faith, which is tried and tested, so think about that. A childlike faith, which is tried and tested into a mature faith that still needs to remain childlike, it finds God faithful and true to his word offering a model for spiritual growth and reliance upon God to other people, to those around us. And lastly, here on this, on this day, the psalmist's focus on the well-being of God's people, it underscores our role in strengthening the church through our experiences of God's faithfulness. So this has to do with what I, what I was saying before, that when we have a mature relationship with the Lord, when we are able to wait on him, to surrender our life, to surrender our control to him, well, that, that then becomes a model for our peers at church, for our brothers and sisters at church to look at us and learn. Not that we got there by ourselves, and that's where we really have to be careful not to pride ourselves in what or who we are, because we didn't get there by ourselves, or we didn't get there in and of ourselves. When it comes to Christian maturity, it has... It has very little to do with the actual person and a lot to do or everything to do with God. The only participation there is that the person makes themselves available. Being mature Christians means that we share that maturity. We share the experience with, uh, our experience with God with those that are still growing in it. Again, we shouldn't do so presumptuously because after all, those who are more mature in their walk did not get there by themselves. But sharing these encounters with God helps bolster the faith of others, both within and outside of the church community. It's a reminder that our spiritual journey, it's not only about a personal relationship with God, but also contributing to the faith and to the well-being of the, of the wider community, the wider church community. And that takes us into Tuesday's lesson, which has the title, Bringing in the Sheaves. Bringing in the Sheaves. This day right here, this lesson revolves around Psalm 126. And it beautifully encapsulates the theme of God's deliverance and its impact on the lives of his people. The deliverance that God renders for his people in the Bible. And how that then translates over to our life every day. 
So this psalm, it reflects on past liberations, things that they had been through, moments where the Lord had manifested himself in their own life as a source of unending hope and inspiration. And so the joy of past deliverances, of past events, described as dreamlike in its intensity, it encourages current generations to relive and to internalize those moments. That's why we find in the children of Israel this extremely strong culture of uh, oral tradition where the elders of the towns, the elders of the cities, they would bring the kids, bring the younger generations and talk about the ancient, the old works of God in the life of the children of Israel, in the experience of their nation. And so over and over and over again throughout the successive generations, they would encourage their children to remember the acts of God of old. Because differently from the human experience, this God never grows old. And the God that was is the God that is and is the God that shall be. And so these children, by learning the things that, were, that, that did happen in the past, they could be certain that that same God would still do the same things. That's why, friends, sometimes we become, we become prisoners of a negative past, but we also sometimes become prisoners of a positive past. Now, that might seem a little bit contradictory, but think about it. Sometimes we, we, we remember the bad things of the past and that discourages us. And the Lord, he calls us to not consider the things of old then. But in scripture, you'll also see that God tells us to not become prisoners of a positive past in the sense that sometimes we think that God has already used all of his power, that God has already done everything that he's going to do in the past, and that we can't really expect greater things in the future. Friends, the God of heaven, he can tell you and me the following. He can say, you haven't seen anything yet, because the best with God is always yet to come. And that's what we're learning here throughout this. That's why the Israelites found it so important to repeat over and over and over again the stories of the past, the exodus, the plagues of Egypt, the opening of the Red Sea, the manna falling from heaven, the provisions of God, the protection of God. As the lesson puts it, the Lord's miraculous deliverances in the past are an inexhaustible source of inspiration for God's people and their source of hope for the future. The past deliverance was so great that it could be described as a dream come true experience. Notice that the generation that praises the Lord in Psalm 126 for his past deliverance of his people from captivity is presently in captivity. <laughs> when we read Psalm 126, we see the significance of these words that were just mentioned here. Because it says, when the Lord brought back the captivity of Zion... We were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us and we are glad. Bring back our captivity, O Lord, as the streams of the south. Now, you might be asking yourself, what, what are these allusions to? What are these uh, metaphors of the streams of the south and so on and, uh, and, and so forth? And so the metaphor of the streams of the south is a powerful illustration of God's transformative power. That's what it's talking about. Just as arid lands are suddenly rejuvenated by rain, God can turn around seemingly hopeless situations. Friends, there are so many times in my life where I didn't know I could not know what would come next. Moments that can, I can only describe as hopeless. And perhaps here I'm being a little bit dramatic because while I've been through those situations, none of them have truly been you know, life-threatening situations, with the exception of a few. <laughs> but I'm sure that there are those out there listening to this can recount, that can remember truly hopeless situations. And what I mean by that are situations that seem beyond hope. But... The God of the Bible has in his nature, at his very core, this attribute of transforming blessings from curses. Creating blessings from curses. And so that's the attribute that's being described here. This is the God that can transform the worst to the best. The hopeless to the hopeful. The dark into light. 
And this idea is further reinforced by the imagery of sowing in tears and reaping in joy, which symbolizes the journey from sorrow to happiness that's guided by his own providence. This is what we find here in verses 5 through uh, 5 and 6, chapter 126, 5 and 6, that says, Those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. He who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. The harvest motif that we find here in Psalm 126, it extends beyond agricultural practices to spiritual lessons. You know, the truth is that in the Bible, you'll see that there are several different parables and psalms that are referred to the world of agriculture. And just as we find in real everyday agriculture, you'll find those same truths being revealed in the Christian life. And there are three major rules here, which is you reap what you plant. So if you plant, you know, um, an apple, that's what you're going to reap later on, right? The second is that you don't reap in the same moment in which you sow. Sometimes you do something and the effects of that thing will only be seen much later, perhaps years later. And so you reap what you sow. You reap in a different time than when you sow. And you reap a larger quantity than what you sow. Sometimes people are just planting, you know, those little beans. They're small, those little seeds. But later on, they'll reap bushels and bushels and cartons and cartons of whatever they, they planted. So those are the three laws of uh, agriculture. Those are the three laws that we have to take attention to or pay attention to in the Christian life as well. We reap what we sow. We reap later than when we sow, and we reap in a different proportion than what we sow. And so that's what we find here in this reality. That's, that harvest motif is very big in, in the whole Bible. The laborious sowing and tending of fields, it paralleled with trials faced by God's people. And that's seen as leading to a joyous harvest. Because they went from the difficult, laborious moments of life into the great celebrations of life. It's a metaphor for salvation and for the fulfillment of God's promises. How he fulfills his promises in our life every day. This imagery also points to the eventual restoration of God's kingdom. An event that's eagerly anticipated by everyone who awaits in Christ's second coming. You know, I've often said that if it weren't for the promise of the second coming, well, then what would be the point of anything? That is our glorious promise. The one promise that upon it is hinged every other promise in Scripture. The fact that Jesus will come back. That Jesus will return. Without that promise, friends, we'd just be wasting our time here. But the fact that he's promised to bring a conclusion to this mess... Well, that makes it worth living through these perplexities. It makes it worth living through the problems and the hardships of the Christian life. Because the truth is that being born into a fallen world with a fallen nature, it doesn't create a, a shock, an impact with evil. And what I mean by that is that sometimes it seems that those who are doing wrong, those who are doing evil, well, they're having a great life. They are, you know, reaping good, uh, good things from the things that they have done, which are, in fact, evil. And sometimes it seems as though those who are doing the right thing, the good thing, well, they're not getting much out of life. But the reality is that when we, when we become children of God, when we are born again into the kingdom of God, well, that's when we don't, we don't really have resonance with evil anymore. And that means that there will be a shock within the nature that's still warring inside of us. And that's where you get, you know, texts such as, for example, Romans chapter 7, where Paul is, is talking about this reality where, well, he is a converted man, and yet he feels that there is this war waging within him where he, he knows what he wants to do, but he doesn't have the strength to do it. And the things that he doesn't want to do, that, those are the things that he does. And so that's the reality here, that we're living here before the second coming of Christ. But the truth is that the only reason that makes it worth living through this reality is the fact that Jesus promised that he's coming again. And that's what we're reading about here. 
And so reflecting on personal experiences of God's intervention, which is highlighted here by this psalm, it reminds us that God is active in our life. Otherwise, the situation would be hopeless. The fact that God is active in our life is what makes life bearable, at least for me. But this is something that we need to create a discipline. We need to create a habit out of contemplating day by day. Because if you just go through the ebb and flow of life, the highs and the lows, without thinking about what happens, without contemplating on the events of life, well, again, that's not really an active act of waiting in the Lord. It's completely reactive and passive. And in Scripture, waiting, it's not reactive. It's not passive. It is, in fact, an active activity. These experiences where we've seen the Lord's hand at work in our life, It provides us with a reservoir of hope, of reassurance, particularly during the challenging times of life. If you want to be faithful, if you want to be encouraged, if you want to be hopeful for the future, contemplate on the past acts of God's care and power in your own life. And so in essence, Psalm 126 teaches us about the rhythm of spiritual life. Times of trial, which are followed by times of blessing. And it calls us to maintain faith and patience, trusting in God's timing and his ultimate plan for the restoration and salvation of his children. And then that's where we come into Wednesday's lesson, which has the title, the title, Waiting in God's Sabbath Rest. And I love this day. Anything and everything that has to do with the Sabbath is completely beautiful, extraordinary. This is where we explore the deep rest which is offered through the Sabbath. A concept which is deeply ingrained in the Psalms. Especially here when we read, for example, Psalm 92. Which is dubbed, its title is, A Song for the Sabbath Day. This is a psalm, a hymn, that the children of Israel would sing especially for their Sabbath days of rest. The rest which is described here transcends physical rest. And one thing that we have to come to understand when it comes to the Sabbath in Scripture is that the Sabbath, it doesn't have anything primarily to do with physical or even emotional rest. The rest of the Sabbath is a spiritual rest. It's a rest in God. It's a form of waiting in the Lord. It embodies a spiritual tranquility and trust in God's providence. The Sabbath, it offers a sacred pause. It's a temple in time that allows us to reflect on God's word and his actions in our lives. It enhances our relationship with him. I, if you remember, if you go back to the book of Genesis, chapter 1, you'll see that during the first three days of creation, God is creating environments. Right? On the first day, he creates the cycle of time. He creates the light and the dark, the first day, the first cycle. On the second day, he separates the waters from the skies. Right? And on the third day, he creates the dry land. He separates the dry land from the waters, and he creates also the vegetation. These are environments. These are places to then be filled. So on the fourth day, you'll see that what he creates then, it then fills the first day. The sun, it fills the lighter portion of the day. The moon fills the darker portion, which is the night. The stars fill that cycle, the cycles of time, the harvest, the seasons. So the fourth day is the filling of the environment being created on the first day. The fifth day being where God creates the fish, the the animals of the deep, of the waters, and then also the birds of the heavens, that fills in the environment created on the second day which was the waters and the skies. And then on the third day, you have the Lord then filling the environment created on the third day, which is the dry land with the earthly animals, the mammals, the beasts of the field, humans. But then you find the seventh day, the Sabbath day. And that's an interesting day because God also creates an environment. He creates the Sabbath. And the reason why the Sabbath is distinct from the other first six days is because he does something on that day that he doesn't do on any of the other days. He rests from his activity of creation. And he blesses and he hollows that seventh day. So the question is, if God creates an environment on that seventh day, which is the seventh, the Sabbath day of rest, what does he fill that day with? You remember that there's a pattern on the other days. The first, second, third, he creates environments. Fourth, fifth, and sixth, he fills those environments. So on the seventh, he does very obviously create an environment called the Sabbath, but what does he fill it with? He fills it with himself. 
And that's why it's an invitation for us to spend that time, that environment with him. It's an invitation coming from God to spend time, to relate, to wait in him. The themes of waiting and trust central to the Psalms find a harmonious expression in the Sabbath rest. It's a weekly reminder to lay aside our efforts, our work, our preoccupations, and to immerse ourselves in God's grace, his strength, his provision, his providence. And this practice, it not only rejuvenates us spiritually, but it also anchors us in the promise of eternal rest in God's kingdom. Not only this, but the Sabbath rest serves as a metaphor for our own spiritual journey. In a world that values constant activity, the hustle and the bustle of our weekly schedule, the Sabbath reminds us of the importance of spiritual rest, of reliance on God. It's a time, friends, of deep contemplation, of gratitude and connection, or better, reconnection, which is what the word religion means. The best definition for religion is Sabbath. Religion comes, the, comes from the word religari, which literally means to reconnect, to rebond. What is the Sabbath if not a weekly reconnection to God? A weekly moment of intimacy with our Creator, the one who not only made us, but saved us, redeemed us. That's why here in Psalm 92, verse 1 through 5, we find it is good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your loving kindness in the morning and your faithfulness every night. On an instrument of ten strings, on the lute and on the harp, for you, Lord, have made me glad through your work. I will triumph in the works of your hands. O Lord, how great are your works. Your thoughts are very deep. Do you notice here the theme of praise in music, of worship through music? on the lute and on the harp. You know, I feel that nowadays, and I work with children here at the Granite Bay Church, um, I, I, I truly feel that there is an ongoing battle coming from God's enemy to distimulate our children from singing. I'm in Sabbath schools, I'm in youth programs. The kids, they kind of mumble along. It's awkward, it's strange. They don't want to sing. And yet in scripture, we find that music is central to worshiping the Lord. Why is that? Could it be, for example, could it be for the fact that God's enemy is also a musical being? That when he was created, he was given instruments of music as sigils of his identity? Perhaps. But I find it interesting that there is this ongoing battle. But here's the thing. God gave those sigils to this being, to Lucifer, when he was created. And so if Lucifer is a musical being and he uses it against the Lord, wouldn't you think that the creator of music is more powerful, is stronger than his enemy? Of course he is. So God, don't count God out. The Lord is stronger. He is more powerful. He wins. The concept of rest in the Psalms, especially in relation to the Sabbath, it's a call to embrace the peace and the presence of God. It teaches us the value of slowing down. You know, I remember as a child going down, my dad had a, this is when we lived in Brazil, there, he, there, our basement at home, it was his library. And so there were books stacked upon books, stacked upon books. And I would go down and just rummage through his books. He didn't really like it because I left a mess, you know. But I remember that in one of his, uh, one of his cupboards there, one of the, uh, the he had this, uh, this, I forgot what it's called, but it's one of these places that has a bunch of uh, drawers. And there was a sticker with a turtle, and written on the sticker was, Slow me down, Lord. The Sabbath represents that. It's that sticker that reminds us what is truly important, what truly matters in life. It's a sticker <laughs> that says, Slow me down. Let me see what truly matters. Ultimately, friends, waiting in God's Sabbath rest is an invitation to an experience that is deeper, more meaningful regarding our relationship with the Lord. It's a weekly opportunity to step back from the busyness of life 
and to find solace in God's eternal promises. Recharging us for the journey ahead and reminding us of the everlasting rest that awaits us in his kingdom. Ask yourself, was the Sabbath created for the week that comes or the week that went by? I feel that sometimes we, we have the mentality that it was created for the week that went by. Oh, I'm so tired. Let me now sleep the whole day. Let me rest. No, the Sabbath is a spiritual rest first and foremost. Think about it. Adam and Eve were created on the sixth day and they kept the first Sabbath. What were they tired from? They had just been created. <laughs> were they sleepy? Were they tired? No, it was preparing them for the week ahead for the rest of their lives. The Sabbath is primarily a rest in future, in the future dependence that we have on the Lord, the future hope that we have in him. Finally, Thursday's lesson, joy comes in the morning. This reveals a symbolic significance of mourning as a time of divine redemption, which is portrayed through several psalms and also in the New Testament scriptures. You know, the mourning represents a shift from darkness to light, from despair to hope, from sorrow to joy. It's a theme that is especially resonant here in the book of Psalms where the dawning of the day is seen as a metaphor for God's saving power. The lesson puts it like this. It says, in the Psalms, mourning is typically the time when God's redemption is anticipated. Mourning reveals God's favor, which ends the long night of despair and trouble. In Psalm 143, God's deliverance will reverse the present darkness of death into the light of a new morning and being in the pit into residing in the land of uprightness. Friends, the resurrection of Jesus is a great example of this symbolism. The disciples' encounter with, this, with the risen Christ on that resurrection morning transformed their profound sorrow, which was, you know, very explainable, very understandable, but it transformed that sorrow, that hurt, that pain into unspeakable joy. And it's embodied in the promise that we find here in Psalm 30, verse 5, that says this, Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. My friend, have you been weeping in life? Has that been your experience, perhaps? As it is for several people, for most people. Know that scripture compares that to just one night. But that joy manifests itself in the morning. Joy is found in the morning. Not only this, but the imagery of Jesus as the bright and morning star of Revelation 22, verse 16, it heralds a new beginning, a new era marked by eternal life. Marked by the establishment of his everlasting kingdom, which is a kingdom free of darkness, free of night, free of evil, death, free of all of these things. Friends, there are several reasons why I want to go to heaven. One of them being that heaven is the land of no more. No more pain, no more sorrow, no more hopelessness, no more lack of purpose. We live in a time where people suffer from a lack of purpose, no ambition, no desire for anything. Heaven will be the land of no more, no more separation, no, no more midnight tears. No more loneliness. It's the ultimate realization of our hope and it's the culmination of our waiting on the Lord. You know, in the book, The Desired of Ages, on page 785, we read something that can only be described as sublime. It says this, Over the rent sepulcher of Joseph, Christ had proclaimed in triumph, I am the resurrection and the life. These words could be spoken only by the deity. All created beings live by the will and power of God. They are dependent recipients of the life of God. From the highest seraph to the humblest animate being, all are replenished from the source of life. Only he who is one with God could say, I have power to lay down my life and I have power to take it again. In his divinity, Christ possessed the power to break 
the bonds of death, to break the chains of sin. Friends, here we are reminded of the significance of Jesus' resurrection. His victory over death not only demonstrates his divinity, but it also assures us of the temporary nature of death. Death is not the final enemy. Death is vanquished. It's already conquered. For those who believe in God, the first resurrection is marked by the resurrection to eternal life. In Christ, death becomes a transitional phase leading to eternal life. And what that means is that I don't need then to fear death. I don't need then to be afraid. And so the resurrection of Jesus offers a deep promise regarding the temporality of death. It reassures us that though death is a reality of our fallen condition, it is something that we deal with here. And here I'm not trying to downplay the horror of death. What I'm trying to say is that its tyranny is gone. Its dominion is not permanent. For we have one who broke the chains of death and opened up the doors of the grave. It reassures us that though though death is a reality in our present condition, it is merely a transient reality in the face of the eternal life that Jesus has secured for us in heaven. And this understanding should continuously inspire us to comfort us, especially in our moments of grief and our moments of loss, reinforcing our faith in the eternal mourning of God's salvation that awaits us. And that is why we can truly wait on the Lord. If there's one thing that I've learned throughout this quarter studying this lesson is that waiting on the Lord is God's call to his children. The walk of faith, the walk of resilience in God's character, it's something that is easier said than done. Of course it is. But we're called not to give up. We're called to understand that we don't lose the fight when we fall. It's when we're convinced not to get back up that things become severe. But the same God that was there in the beginning the same God that is there already at the end has promised to remove us from that pit, to place our feet on sturdy ground, to put a new song in our mouth, on our lips, and to carry us. And so waiting in the Lord, much more than a reactive stance, a reactive and passive outlook on life, it defines action. Faith in God defines action moving towards the sovereign goal that we have in Christ. And so, my dear friend, I hope, I pray that as you studied your lesson this quarter, you were able to grow in this. You were able to meet the Lord, to know more about him, to come to have an experience with him. Throughout the book of Psalms, we see so many, we learn so many marvelous lessons about what the Lord wants for his children, about who he is, about what he's done, and what he can still do in your life and in mine. That's my prayer for you. That is my hope for you. We're going to have a marvelous study in our next quarter's lesson, so continue studying your lesson. These videos here of our Sabbath School Study Hour, they're not intended to substitute your study of the lesson. They're intended to be more of a a tool, a companion as you go through your, your, your life. I hope that that's what they are for you. I would still like to invite you to take advantage of this free offer right here. It's called The Last Night on Earth, and it accompanies beautifully what we just studied here that is waiting on the Lord, the call to wait on the Lord. And if you'd like to acquire a physical copy of this, you could call the number 866-788-3966. Again, 866-788-3966, and you can ask for the offer number 101. If you're in continental North America, you can text the number, uh, you could text SH081 to the number 40544. If you're outside of continental North America, you can go to study.aftv.org and you can get, uh, or study.aftv.org slash SH081 and you could get a digital download copy be that through the text or through the the website, then you'll be able to read this on your phone or on your computer, and it will be a great 
enhancement to your study. I'd like to invite you to bow your head and to pray with me as we conclude our lesson for this quarter. Dear Lord God, I thank you, I praise you for all of your blessings. Lord, I praise your name for the book of Psalms that has taken us, Lord, through the highs and the lows of human experience. Lord, I don't know who I'm talking to here right now. I don't know what each of these listeners have gone through, but you are there right now in their home, in their mind, in their heart. And I know that your spirit is fighting for them, Lord. I know that your spirit is banishing and vanquishing the darkness. But Father, the thing about the darkness is that it always tries to creep back in. And so just as these psalmists had to struggle with this constant reality, the fight against the forces of darkness, I ask you, Lord, to help us in that fight. Allow these lessons that we learned here in this book, in this portion of scripture, allow it to ring true in our day-to-day life. Help us know you more, know you better. Help us apply these lessons to our own life, Lord. Please be with our families, Be with your church around the world that is going through so much right now and allow your church, in spite of its stumbling, in spite of its problems, to wait in you and in the marvelous marvelous morning that you promise to bring very soon, Lord. Bless your children. Apply your words. Apply your truth in their life. And Lord, I don't ask you these things because I have any power. There is no power in my name. But I do ask in the authority, in the grace, and in the love of Christ Jesus, your Son, who sits right now before you, interceding for us. I ask in his name, in his power, amen and amen. My dear friend, may God bless you. Again, continue studying your lesson. There are so many beautiful uh, truths to be learned here, and I'm sure that the Lord will guide you in all these things. And I'd like to repeat what my brother Carlo says, Maranatha. May the Lord soon come. May God bless you. Don't forget to request today's life-changing free resource. Not only can you receive this free gift in the mail, you can download a digital copy straight to your computer or mobile device. To get your digital copy of today's free gift, simply text the keyword on your screen to 40544 or visit the web address shown on your screen. And be sure to select the digital download option on the request page. It's now easier than ever for you to study God's Word with amazing facts wherever and whenever you want. And most important, to share it with others.